Hello, today's topic is 8.6, and we're going to talk all about groundwater today. And we'll be talking about the different factors that affect the infiltration of groundwater. So what are the groundwater zones? Once um, the groundwater infiltrates into the soil, there's two distinct areas that the water will occupy. The first that it will reach is the zone of aeration. This is the unsaturated layer beneath the surface. So this is filled with lots of loose sediment and lots of pore space air and some water, and this is where plant roots tend to be. So close to the surface, when the water first starts seeping in, you'll find this unsaturated layer. That means it's not full of water. So there's plenty of air in there um, still and pore space. So if you think about the pores on your space, they're like little holes in your face. It's the same idea in between um, the particles of sediment, which would be like sand or clay um, or silt or pebbles, you'll find spaces, and those are referred to as pore space. And then the zone of saturation, once the water continues to seep in and it becomes completely wet and the water fills up all of those pore spaces, this is called the zone of saturation. And this place is completely full of water. And then once you get to the area where it's completely solid rock, this is your impermeable bedrock layer. Water cannot go through this area. So impermeable um, means that water cannot penetrate. Permeable would mean it can penetrate. So impermeable would be like if you wear a raincoat, the water cannot go through. So anything waterproof would be impermeable. The water table defines the two zones. So this is the boundary between your zone of aeration and your zone of saturation. So if you look at this little picture here, you can see the area that is completely filled with water. This is the zone of saturation. And the water table is this boundary between where the um, it's there is some um, air space still, the zone of aeration, and where it's completely full. This is your water table. And your water table boundary um, changes depending on how much per, um, precipitation an area has. So somewhere like us, our water table rises as it rains, and it sinks, it gets lower, lower down as it um, we have dry spouts. If you live in um, a very dry area like Arizona, their water table is very low because they get very little precipitation. So it rises and falls depending on climate and the amount of precipitation. And again, this is another picture showing your impermeable bedrock here and your zone of saturation. The water table would be this boundary and the zone of aeration. If you have a river or a lake, that's part of your zone of saturation. That also defines your water table. And this is another picture that's, that is a typical region's picture I thought I'd show you, showing your impermeable bedrock, a stream, which also lines up with your water table, this boundary of water table. When people drop wells in, they drop wells into the zone of saturation. Okay, and then here's your zone of aeration. This is the first area that the water has to infiltrate through until it gets to where it's completely saturated. An aquifer. On Long Island, we have particular experience with aquifers since this is the type of groundwater that we have. An aquifer is a really special groundwater situation, and we're very fortunate on Long Island to have this. Okay, it is um, an aquifer is groundwater that's confined by an impermeable layer and open to receive water from the surface. So something is is keeping it right here from going all the way through and it's allowing water to come through and fill it back up. So we have this type of situation on Long Island. We typically have a, a layer of, of um, clay here that doesn't allow water to go through very easily and it confines it and keeps it, keeps it available for us to, to pump out. An artesian well is another special situation. Um, it's a, a well that you could see here the, the way that this area is, the, um, the groundwater is on a slope. So as this water is, is moving downward in, within the, the ground, it actually, if you drop a well in here, due to the pressure from the water coming down, it'll pump up without any type of pump. It'll naturally rise to the surface due to the pressure beneath. Okay, So you have certain, certain types of areas where they um, have this sloped groundwater. You, an artesian well can be dropped in. So these are the factors that affect infiltration or runoff. Porosity, permeability, capillarity, slope or gradient of the land, climate conditions of the surface, vegetation, saturation of the soil, and land use. So porosity is the amount of openings or pore spaces between sediment for the water to pass through. 
So we just talked about this. So in this picture here, you can see that we have our particles of sediment. And in between here, there's space. That is your pore space. So we talk about porosity based on the percentage of space that's available for water to seep into. Okay, so based on shape, so there's different factors that affect porosity. Okay, the rounder the shape, the greater the porosity. So the rounder the shape allows more water to squeeze in here than if they're angular. So if we look at a graph on this, as rounding increases, what happens to porosity? It also increases. So as your, um, pour, as your sediment gets rounder, there is more porosity. Now, there's a special condition with porosity. If we're looking at um, sediment that's all the same shape. So in this case, they're all round. They're all spheres. Okay, And if we're looking to compare just the size. So we have same shape, different sizes. When it comes to porosity, size doesn't matter. So with porosity, if it's the same shape, all three of these containers will fit the same volume of water. So the porosity is the same. When it comes to porosity, size doesn't matter. Porosity will remain the same. So all these little spaces in the first container will add up to the same amount as in the bigger spaces as your, your spheres are larger. Okay, so if we filled this with water, the same volume of water would fit in each container to fill it to the top. The pore, pore space is the same. They all have 48% porosity in this example. So porosity is independent of particle size. There's no relationship. So as particle size increases, porosity does not change. Here's another example. We're looking at how packed they are. So if you have the same size and shape particles, but these are not packed, and these have been pushed together and packed, you can definitely see that your pore spaces have decreased from them being packed together. So as the particles are more closely packed, the porosity decreases. Now if they're sorted versus unsorted, okay, sorted we have you know uniform size and shape. Here we have tightly packed. All the little pieces have mixed into the spaces between the big pieces. So when you have them sorted, they are the same size. Unsorted would be mixed sizes. So sorted samples will have a greater porosity than unsorted samples. If you tried to put water in here, a lot more water would fit in here than would fit here since the little sediment has filled in those holes. So as the degree of sorting, as sorting increases, porosity also increases. And as porosity increases, if we have more space, infiltration rate also increases. The more space there is, the easier the water will seep into the, to the ground or infiltrate. Permeability is the ability of water to flow through. So this is the ability of water to get through the particles. So it says connected pores give a rock permeability. So water is the ability of water to pass in between the particles of sediment. Per permeability rate is the speed that fluids flow downward through a material. So if you look at these four samples of, um, of rock, which one will have the greatest permeability? The quartz sandstone here, you can see that there's much more pore space, so it would be permeable. The igneous rock, water would not be able to get through very easily. Clay, because there's really small pore spaces, will not have good permeability or porosity. And glacial till is mixed, so it would also have low porosity and low permeability. And so we talk about the amount of pore space through porosity and the ability of water to flow through is permeability. So let's look at these three containers again. If we poured water through each one of these, which one of these would allow water to pass through the particles the easiest? With same shape and different sizes, the porosity is going to be the same. However, the greatest permeability would be for C. So in loose particles, the larger the particle size, the easier or the faster the water will flow through. So as particle size increases, our permeability increases. The water is able to pass through those particles more easily. With permeability, the more permeable or the higher the permeability, the faster the infiltration rate. So again, it's a direct relationship. As particle size increases, what happens to retention? So retention means that the water um, sticks to the particles as they pass through. So if you think about when you take a bucket of sand and you pour water into it, if you try to drain that water out of the sand, a lot of the water will stay in the sand and stick to the particles. So 
if, where if you took a bucket of pebbles and did the same thing and poured water in and tried to drain the water, a lot more water would come out. So it's actually related to the particle size. The larger the grain size, the less water the sample will retain or hold. So we have an indirect relationship here. As the particle size increases, less water is retained or held onto or sticks to the sediment. The more spherical or round what happens to permeability. So which of these two pictures do you think water would flow through easier if we tried to pour water through these two samples? Again, the rounder, the easier that will flow through. So greater permeability as it gets more round. So as degree of roundness increases, it gets more round, it gets more permeable. Um, angular shapes are going to retain more water. More water will stick to these particles. More water will pass through these particles. We have a direct relationship between roundness and permeability. All right, so here again, imagine pouring water over this uh, gravel, fine sand, and clay. Okay, you can see the gravel. We have a good amount of water passing through, um, larger pieces. Fine sand, it'll pass through, just not as quickly. And clay, really slow. If anyone's ever played baseball on a clay field or been to a baseball game where they have a clay field, Clay puddles the water up, and they actually have to go out and rake it to get the water off the field. So clay does not allow water to pass through and infiltrate easily at all. So we're going to turn to page 6 in our reference table um, to talk about some of these factors again. So let's, again, write down the size of our different particles from reference table page 6. Boulders are size 25.6 centimeters or greater. Infiltration rate would be very high. Okay, um, large pieces, the water passes through easily. Clay, the size would be less than 0 .0004 centimeters. And for this, the infiltration rate would be very slow, very low and slow. Water does not pass through clay easily. So which is more permeable? Which can water pass through easier? How about sandstone and shale? So if you check your um, sedimentary chart and look at the grain size, you'll see that sandstone has, a, uh, is, has sand-sized particles, where shale is clay-sized particles. So water will infiltrate sandstone much more easily. Capillarity is the ability of a soil to draw water upward into tiny spaces between soil grains. Plants rely on this in order to um, get water from the ground. So water is able to flow upward against the force of gravity. Um, when you have small particles. If you've ever taken a piece of paper towel and dipped it into water, which it will, you know, we'll do in class too, you'll see water will travel upward in that paper towel. The same thing if you've gone outside on a rainy night in jeans and your jeans touch the ground, all of a sudden that water is rising up and your jeans are getting wet much higher up on your, on your leg than where the actually touched the water. These are all examples of capillarity when it happens in, um, in the ground. Okay, this is in small particles. So water is moving upward against the force of gravity because of the attraction between water molecules and the surfaces of the soil particles. So here's my example. It's a paper towel and you watch the water move upward into the towel. Capillary water is water that rises above the water table into the zone of aeration and becomes available for plants to draw in through their roots. So if we have a dish of water and we put a tube of sand, a tube of clay, and a tube of loam, which is very like silt-like, you can see the water will be, will be drawn up to the sand, drawn up really high into the clay, and drawn up into the loam. And the smaller the particle, the more easily capillarity occurs. Okay, it depends on size. Small, loose particles have the greatest capillarity. So as particle size increases, par capillarity decreases. Okay, as the particles get bigger, it doesn't travel upwards as easily. So this is an indirect relationship. Infiltration, so water moving through the ground occurs when the surface is unsaturated and permeable. Unsaturated means it's not full of water. Permeable means the water is able to flow through. If the soil is saturated, it's already full, the water is not going to go through. If it's impermeable, the water cannot go through, so the water will not go through. Slope gradient of the land. So as you have a sloped land, if you have a hill or a, you know, a mountain, water is going to more easily run off and not flow into the surface. So as your gradient increases, the infiltration rate will decrease. You can see it in this relationship here, as gradient or slope increases, the infiltration rate will decrease. More water is going to run off than, than seep into the ground. And climate conditions. In a dry climate, 
you're going to have great infiltration and less runoff. In a humid climate, you will have less infiltration and more runoff because there's already water in the ground. In a dry climate, the water should flow right through since it's not full of water beneath the surface. If you have a lot of vegetation, plants, okay, they, they, they tend to keep the soils um, less packed. So your infiltration rate will increase and runoff will decrease. Vegetation, plants, trees um, help this area allow water to infiltrate. Saturation of the soil versus infiltration rate. So as your soil becomes more saturated, it's going to become full and not allow many more water to go through. So as saturation of the soil increases, your infiltration rate will decrease. Okay, if it's already full, less infiltration will occur, and this would be an indirect relationship. Roads, parking lots, buildings create impermeable surfaces of cement, of pavement, blacktop, stop water from being able to infiltrate into the ground. So these increasing the land use of humans results in less infiltration and more runoff. More water runs across those impermeable surfaces and needs to find a sewer to drain into which then has to be taken somewhere to be cleaned after it's picked up all the uh, pollution from the ground. And that completes 8.6, our last topic for this unit.